Hello and welcome to Church at Home with Rachel for Tuesday the 11th of October. My name is Rachel Parker. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. And I am the rector or the priest in charge um, of um, Day Spring Ministries, which is a, 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 a congregational, it's a three congregation ministry of churches in the Diocese of Edmonton, the Anglican Church of Canada. And we are located in Alberta, in the southeastern corner of the diocese. And Day Spring Ministries is comprised of um, St. Mary's Anglican Church in Edgerton, St. Saviour's in Vermilion, and St. Thomas in Wainwright. And it's my pleasure to have you here with me today. Today I'd like to talk about the things that um, cause us to think differently about something. Um, have you ever had an experience in your life where, where you've been sort of heading down the road and you're like, this is what I believe and this is what I think and nothing's ever going to change that. And all of a sudden you run smack dab into something else and all of a sudden you're like, okay, I think I've changed my mind. It, it can be a real blow to your pride, can't it? When you've been adamant about something and all of a sudden your whole worldview changes and you think about something differently, all of a sudden you have a different perspective. Now, if we're, if we're really being mature and we're being dignified, we will give ourselves permission to change our minds. We won't, we won't be judgmental with ourselves. We'll just say, you know what? My worldview just got bigger. I have a different perspective. Something's happened and I understand the world a little differently. Part of us may feel a little bit itchy about that simply because, you know, maybe we were judgmental. Maybe in the past, that very thing we just changed our mind about was something that we used to, to, to do to be horrible about. Uh, if that's what happens to us, we need to remember somebody kind of important within the Christian world. Do you remember Saul? In the Acts of the Apostles, we hear about the very first Christian martyr, St. Stephen. He had been preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, been sharing it with other people, and he was sentenced to being stoned to death. And we hear about Saul, a great persecutor of these new Christians, who was holding the cloaks of the people who were about to stone Stephen to death. Well, not much further into the Acts of the Apostles, it's a book in the Bible if you're not, a, not familiar with it. It's actually kind of interesting. You should probably check it out. It's in the New Testament. It is the fifth book of the New Testament. So it's about three quarters of the way through a whole Bible if you open it up. And in this, we hear about Saul walking along a road and all of a sudden he's like struck with a blinding light and hears his voice saying, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And it's the voice of Jesus speaking. He's risen. He's gone to heaven. He has ascended. And here's Paul, Saul, sorry, Saul, who is actually on his way to try to hunt down Christians and get them in trouble, throw them in jail, you know, maybe stone some more. And all of a sudden he has this experience of Jesus speaking to him and saying, why are you persecuting me? What, what have you got against me? What have I done to you? And Saul is blind. He's, he's like scales in his eyes. He's blinded. And he has a conversion experience. He realizes that what he has been doing is wrong. And he is called now to serve Jesus, not persecute the followers of Jesus. And this is interesting because Paul was the most, like, he was the most in it up to your eyeballs kind of guy. He was not a toe in the water guy. He was a dive straight in. Don't even check out the water. So when he was persecuting Christians, he was like the ultimate persecutor of Christians. And then he has this conversion experience and he goes off by himself for a little while when he can't see and Jesus is doing some work on his soul and when the scales fall from his eyes he's a different man no longer is he persecuting Christians now he is reaching out to them you can hear my dog on the other side of the door he wants in um, he is not no longer is he persecuting Christians now he is supporting them now he's trying to teach people about why it's important to be a Christian to follow Jesus Christ it's incredible his way of turning around he doesn't deny that he used to do that but he says I I once was that way and now I am not centuries later um, a, a song would be written a hymn would be written I once was lost but now am found was blind but now I see that could have been written for Paul himself we we probably all have those moments in our lives and I've had one myself. I've had more than one myself, but one recently where we take a look at those things we used to think 
and realize that we are beyond that now. We can beat ourselves up for being ashamed that we treated people like that, we were that way, or we can ask forgiveness of God and, like Paul, move forward. Don't waste time wallowing in, I can't believe I was like that, but pick yourself up and allow God to free, for, to give you forgiveness, absolution, and move forward in the new way that you're being called to walk. This is not nearly as dramatic um, and this is certainly is, you know, like oh, I wasn't so judgy. I was going out and saying a shame on you, but I have never been a tattoo person. My husband has two. He has one on one shoulder and it is the dates, a, a budded cross and the dates, um, the feast days of his ordination to diaconate and to the priesthood. And the irony is that he was ordained on the feast of ascension and to the diaconate and ordained to the priesthood on the feast of St. Andrew. And his first parish, the churches he had were a two-point parish. One was Ascension in Comber and St. Andrew's in Tilbury. So that was an irony. He didn't intend for that to happen, but it did. On his other shoulder, he has this massive foul anchor, and it is the Sea Service Insignia that in the Canadian Armed Forces, if you're in the Navy and you serve, it used to be 365 days on ship, meaning like out at sea, you could get the Sea Service Insignia. It's a badge. And he had it um, in its its proper colors tattooed on his shoulder. So I don't mind them. I think tattoos are okay for other people. Um, we've lived in a lot of places, obviously, where there's a lot of military. And there are a lot of people who are inked. And now, as of, I think, in September, 1st of September, the Canadian Armed Forces has has updated its rules, its regulations around dress and deportment. So there are more piercings and tattoos allowed um, so we're, we're also got a lot of beards hanging in it, they're pretty scruffy, um, and colored hair. Um, that, that's a whole other thing for another day. <laughs> um, but so a lot of people have tattoos. And I have always been like, you know, I do weddings, like I'm a priest, so I, I preside at weddings. And, you know, you see a bride coming up and like there's her beautiful, her beautiful white dress. And usually it's like, you know, sleeveless it, or it's, um, you know. I was going to say topless. It's never topless. Um, it's It's got no arms. There's nothing holding it up. The bodice holds up with the everything in the bodice holds the dress up. So you've got all this spare skin. And several times I have had brides where every inch of that skin is covered. Sometimes it's covered in a beautiful, you know, flowers or some a beautiful angel or something. And sometimes it's, it's, it's pretty risque. Um, or it's um, the language, some of it. Sometimes it's just unfortunate because they didn't check the spelling <laughs> before they had something tattooed on their body. But I have been a little judgy when it comes to tattoos. Like, your God, God has given you this beautiful body. Why would you do that to do it, especially if it's permanent? And um, I haven't had the conversation with anybody who's who has like a body tattoo, who's sort of completely covered. I have had those conversations with other people who have had tattoos and it's been there's been interesting they have they have good reasons some people are just silly like they just do it because they're addicted to being tattooed and then you kind of wonder what that tattoo is going to look like when they're 80 and things are sagging in all the wrong places i think some some of the um the nurses aides and and nurses and and assistants you know, 20 or 30 years from now are going to have a bit of a, a bit of a giggle when some of the young people of yesteryear come in with their tattoos that are now located south of where they used to be, things like that. But for a lot of people I've spoken to, their tattoos are very personal. They may not look personal. They may look like just a generic whatever. But when you talk about, well, why did they get that tattoo? There's a very particular reason. And that particular reason often brings me to tears. Still not a tattoo person. However, when Rob was in the hospital and we weren't sure how things were going, whether he was going to make it. Um, we were still having the conversation, um, the big one. If this was the last conversation we were going to have, we ever have, what would we want to say to each other? Um, one day he finally, finally got to go for his angiogram and they were taking a while. So I went over right across the street from the, from the, from the hospital is uh, from Misericordia in Edmonton is the West Edmonton Mall. And it's a massive, massive mall. I don't think you could walk the whole thing in four days. Um, but I walked in the door, I got a parking spot right by the door. Amazingly God walked in and there was a tattoo and piercing salon and it was beautiful. Wasn't what I thought tattoo parlors would look like. 
And I walked by and then I walked back and I thought, I think I want to get a tattoo. And then I thought, are you nuts? <laughs> what part of your brain are you working from? I thought, no, you know, I'm going to go in and I'm going to let God make this decision. I know that sounds like a cop out, but I thought if, if, if there's any possibility I can get an appointment, then I'm going to take this as a gift for, as a, as a go ahead from God. So I walked in and I said, you know, I've never had a tattoo before and I'm really nervous. I'm very scared of needles. And she's like, well, no, it's very easy. And this is what it takes. And this is what it will cost. And what are you thinking about? And I told her and she said, okay, let me see. And she said, when would you like to do that? And I said, well, is there an artist around? She said, no, he's gone home for the day. Said, okay, there you go. God does not want me to get a tattoo. But she said, he'll be back tomorrow at 530. He has an appointment at 530 tomorrow. Well, the thing is, Rob used to eat his, in the hospital, Rob would eat his dinner about five o'clock and I would leave and go to the cafeteria and get a bite to eat. I also knew that my parking permit that I bought for the week was going to end at 516 the next on the next day and I have to go downstairs and renew it anyway so I said well how long would it take and she said for a basic what you're looking for about 15 to 20 minutes so I'd be done by six o'clock be back at the hospital by quarter after six so I booked the appointment I chose an anchor Rob's in the Navy and the anchor is a symbol of all that he loves and the anchor is also often used within Christian circles, within the Christian community. Um, St. Andrew, the fisherman, things like that. This, this idea that an anchor, the one who anchors our lives, Jesus Christ himself. Rob is my anchor. For the whole time I've known him, he has been that person who keeps me sane, who keeps me from flying off this way and that, who grounds me and helps me to make good decisions. He is the person who loves me for exactly who I am. And I thought, I want to get an anchor. So I went in at 5.30 the next day and I showed the guy what I wanted. No problem. And he showed me. He said, this is going to be his size. I use CBD oil to numb the area. I thought, I've never used pot in my life, so go for it. And he showed me and he rubbed it down with the CBD oil and did all this, laid it down. And he was chatting away and finally he says, what do you think? I said, well, that looks fantastic. Thank you. Um, go ahead. He said, no, it's already done. It was so easy. I didn't even realize he'd done it. So I said to him, since that was so easy, could you add R and R, Rob and Rachel, R and R. So he added the, the rope to the anchor attached to the R that stands for Rob and then and R. And I got a tattoo. Now you can't see it. It's upside down, but there you go. It's very simple. Just imagine, turn your screen upside down and you'll be able to see what it says. R and R and my anchor. It's healed nicely too. It looks pretty good. I am never going to get another tattoo because they're permanent. I didn't mind the process. And if they were, if I could have one for six months to sort of, you know, show this chapter of my life, I might do that. But since they're permanent, this is, this is it. I had an experience the possibility of losing the love of my life that changed the way I thought about certain things. And now I understand why people get tattoos. And this really isn't about tattoos, but it's about the marking of our lives, the story of who we are. This tattoo is a story, tells a story about who I am and who I love and a particular chapter in my life. And my prayer is that from now until the day I die, I will look at this and I will also be able to look up and see the one who inspired me to get it. And if by chance something were to happen years and years and years and years from now, that he would die before me, I will have this to look at every day to know that I was loved and that God had given me someone in my life who taught me how to be a better person. So it's not nearly as dramatic or powerful or life world changing as Saul becoming Paul, but it taught me a lot about the power of meeting people where they are and appreciating who they are and listening to their story, whether they speak their story with their mouth or they tell their stories with their tattoos. Everybody's story is worth listening to. 
everybody's story is worth telling. Yours, mine, Saul become Paul, Rob's, everyone. So tell your story. It may be through a tattoo or maybe something less permanent, but make sure you take time to share your story because it is blessed and it is important. God bless you, my friends. Have a wonderful day and I will see you again tomorrow for Church at Home with Rachel.